So last time, uh, I said that I was going to start presenting on the abstracting abstract machine stuff. Sometimes I call that AAM for short. Um, uh, and we didn't quite we didn't quite make it there, uh, but we're making good progress on developing uh, an abstract machine for um, our little PCF programming language. And uh, really, so what I, the, the thing I told you yesterday was the idea is I want to come up with a variant of my interpreter that always gives me results, and those results always predict what happens with the real interpreter. Uh, and just to give you a, a sort of uh, look ahead at what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to make an interpreter that's going to be in the form of an abstract machine such that it becomes really easy for me to flip a switch and turn it into uh, an over approximating abstract machine, one that always gives me uh, results and those results always predict what actually happens at runtime. Okay. Uh, so we're just working our way towards that abstract machine that I can flip the switch on. And we got to the point of uh, a stack machine. So I started with a calculus of explicit substitutions for my language. Then I developed uh, the reduction semantics. Then I developed a stack machine semantics. And we ended on the point of I, I wanted to make clear what the relationship was between the stack machine and the reduction semantics because I want those things to coincide, right? I want my machine to be carrying out uh, the reductions uh, for my language, even though they're making explicit what's happening with the managing of the, of the stack. Uh, and it also gives me a, an opportunity to show off another feature of Red X, uh, uh, which I'll get to in a second. So, um, so what I did was I formulated an invariant between um, uh, states in my state machine and terms in my uh, in my calculus. And I, I wrote a test that basically said that, the, you know, so here's an example where if I uh, take the factorial of five program uh, and run it both in the machine and the uh, reduction semantics, I want this invariant to hold the whole time as I run it. So that invariant is really, at its core, is about this... Uh, this relationship that relates uh, states and terms, uh, which says that, well, a value, remember a value is a state and a term, so uh, uh, any value is related to itself. Um, but if you've got a state which can, consists of a closure and a stack, well then that is related to some other closure, uh, C1, if I can uh, transform the stack into an evaluation context, put the closure in the whole of that context, I should arrive at the same closure. Okay, so, and what I want is that, you know, as things progress, either uh, in the machine or the reduction semantics, I want to maintain that this relationship holds uh, throughout the whole running. Okay, so I had to spell uh, spell this claim out. Okay, so if uh, a state and a closure are related, then either uh, they're both values and they're the same value. Okay, so either they're the same uh, and, a, uh, and a value, or the machine take uh, machine state takes a step uh, by either the eval continue or halt transition, okay, and those are transitions that have, they don't correspond to anything in the reduction semantics. They're just shuffling context around, 
okay? Uh, and so uh, that means that in the reduction semantics, nothing is happening. So if I take one of those steps, I should uh, be related to the same closure, okay? So in the semantics, I'm not taking a step, but in the machine, I'm taking one. So if uh, the state steps to some state prime, then that new state I get to ought to be related to uh, the closure I assumed I was related to, uh, related to, in, to begin with. Okay, then the third case of the invariant is my machine takes a step by an apply transition. An apply transition corresponds to a reduction in the reduction semantics. So it ought to be uh, the case that the closure takes a step, and it takes a step to a thing that is related to the machine state that I step to. Okay. And that seems totally sensible, right? I wrote all that down. I ran my, I ran my example. The invariant holds. So uh, I guess I should, maybe I can show you the code that spells, spells this out. But I ran it on my example. Uh, the example worked fine. Okay, so by the well-known proof technique of proof by example, uh, it's a theorem, right? Um, so yeah, this is, I wrote, I, the way that I encoded that uh, invariant was I wrote a, a relation between uh, states and closures, and it, it's pretty straightforward from what I wrote down uh, in the comments there, okay? So uh, if you've got a value and a closure, they have to be equivalent to each other. Uh, if, so this is how I you know, look at uh, how a machine state uh, takes a transition and I match on you know, particular rules uh, and then I make sure that whatever it uh, steps to is also the invariant holds for that, okay? Uh, and then uh, the apply one where I'm applying each of the reduction relations and hold, making sure that the invariant holds on the things that it steps to. Um, so uh, then I decided that what I would do is, so, Really, what I'm, I'm making, the, what I would like to be true is this claim that for any term, for any term m, the invariant holds between running the machine and running the reduction semantics. So I can actually uh, state that in RedX using this RedX check um, thing. So the way that you do it is, uh, if we focus on this, this is really the statement saying, um, you know, if I take a term and inject it into the state space, I take a term and inject it into the space of closures, the invariant should hold. And that should hold for all, let me uncomment this, that should hold for all terms, M. And what RedX check is going to do I don't know why check syntax is taking so long. There we go. Uh, what RedX check is going to do is it's going to generate randomly terms uh, and then just test the theorem. Okay, so I can give RedX check any pattern, and that's sort of like how you quantify over variables in the statement here. Uh, and it will generate things that match that pattern at random and then, uh, and then run it, okay? So, uh, so of course, I, I did that, and, um, and I got counterexamples. So I got counterexamples because I didn't think about the case of uh, what if the machine state or the closure is just stuck? If it's irreducible but not a value, uh, then uh, what I said in, in the invariant doesn't, doesn't hold. I didn't say anything about uh, stuck programs. And so when I ran this, you know, I added this, I added this uh, last night, 
And then it immediately failed, and then I thought, well, now I'm in trouble. So, uh, so I can spend today ridiculing myself instead of, instead of Sam. Um, I don't know why this is taking forever. Uh, sure. Yeah, so um I mean like if I know I have a problem like in a particular area, can I tell it to kind of go Yes. So you you um uh you do have the ability to uh to direct things. One of the ways that you can do it is you can uh you can give a judgment or a relation that you want to use as the basis for generating terms and then it will generate things that satisfy that judgment. So for example, if you only want uh, to talk about closed terms, you can make a judgment for closedness, and then it will, uh, RedX will do a smart job of generating terms according to that judgment such that all of the terms it generates are closed. And you can do the same, you can say, I want, uh, I want things that match the left-hand side of some reduction relation, or things like that. Okay, so I'm just doing a really simple thing here, just saying for all, for all terms m. Okay, so it comes back after three attempts, it didn't take long, uh, to tell me that you know, just an unbound variable, which is stuck, uh, is a, is a counterexample to my, to my claim here. Okay, so I needed to add, I needed to revise my invariant and basically say that, um, uh, the invariant holds of two things if uh, they're equivalent to each other and neither of them steps to anything. So here I'm saying if you apply the reduction relation and you get nothing back, then, right, because I want it to be the case that even things that run along and eventually get stuck, the invariant holds for them as well. Okay, and once I do that, uh, things seem to work out. Okay, and now, of course, uh, of course, I still haven't proven this, right? But it's now just a proof by a lot more examples, okay? And examples that I didn't think up, which, so uh, Redux is maybe generating some very weird examples for me. Um, let me, let me close Dr. Racket because it's been a few days and uh, see if maybe that helps. I mean, this will, take, this will take a little while, but I don't know why it's taking quite so long. Uh, sure, but I've, uh, oh, I guess part of it is I'm, I should just comment out the rest of the code that we haven't gotten to yet and turn <coughs> off debugging. Mm. Let me just take this take this out for now. So it tried a thousand examples and it uh um it couldn't find anything. Okay, I am gonna I am gonna restart Dr. Rocket though, just to. Well, okay. While I'm here, <laughs> let's try something. So, um, I wanted to show you how to get a sense of um, what's happening here. So I can trace the um, I can trace the invariant meta function. Okay. And so what's going to happen now is it'll pr every time I use that meta function, it will print out what the arguments and uh, the return value uh, are. So let me go back and show you.
Okay, so this is going to go by uh, fairly fast. But remember that the invariant meta function, the only thing I want you to sort of come away from with this is the invariant meta function, one, you don't want to write all these test cases, right? This is nice. Uh, uh, but two, the invariant meta function gets called uh, recursively for every step. So we can see by how far this nests, like how many steps uh, we're actually testing here. And when I was watching this while uh, Sue, so you see some things that are taking like 15, 20 steps, things like that. Um, and it's doing, it's generating a thousand, thousand of these terms and it takes a long time to print it all out. Okay. Um, we could stop it and inspect what, you know, weird, weird things it's generating. But, um, and I could do a better job of generating uh, things because this is generating a lot of open terms, right? Uh, if you pick a term at random, it's probably going to be open. So this is probably testing that, you know, things get stuck a lot, but clearly there's, uh, there's some amount of progress that's going on here. And I feel a little better about about things and uh, and certainly right I could write I could write any claim about my language and then randomly test it so maybe I design you know I have a type system and uh, up above I could write down the soundness theorem as a uh, as a claim like this uh, and then I could randomly test it and it's um, in my experience, it's a good idea to do that before you go off and try to prove something, right? Because uh, if there's counterexamples, you're not going to be able to prove it, or maybe you will be able to prove it, but the proof will be wrong, uh, which would be bad. Um, but it's a nice way of it's a nice way of testing things out and refining things before you invest a lot of work. Um, okay, so. That's the random testing facility. I, I feel better about my um, stack machine corresponding to my reduction semantics. So I want to I want to move on. Okay. So the next thing I did, which we can basically skip over, was I I took that machine we just looked at and I added in the error reductions. Okay. So. Um, I won't really go into this because we saw, we saw this yesterday with the reduction semantics adding in the error reductions. Here I'm just doing the same thing but for the machine. Okay, so I want to focus on this next thing. Let me go down and uh, uncomment the rest. Um, So <clears throat> the next machine I'm going to do is I'm going to add a heap, okay? And uh, the idea here, the idea uh, moving forward is I'm going to uh, explicitly model more of what's going on uh, in my machine, and that's in part so that when I go to abstract it, to introduce the approximation, I have my hands on everything that's uh, that's happening in the machine, so that I can I can do stuff with it. Okay. So one thing that's not modeled in this machine is like memory allocation. Okay. I can just uh, uh, in uh, in some sense that's modeled at the meta level. Like I make a larger environment, I make a larger stack. <laughs> Racket has to allocate some memory for me, but I don't see that. Um, I don't see that in my machine. So <clears throat> I'm going to add another component uh, to my machine, uh, uh, sigma here. And it's going to be a mapping from uh, addresses, A, to values. And the idea is I'm going to have this indirection between variables uh, uh, that they get, they get allocated in the uh, in the heap, okay? So my environment uh, changes to the environment is now a mapping from variables to addresses and the heap maps addresses to values. So with two jumps I can recover, you know, looking up what the value of a variable is 
This is what you would do if you were going to model uh, mutable variables. I know that's a, uh, um, an oxymoron, but, uh, uh, but many programming languages have them. Uh, and, um, uh, and this is how you would do it. Uh, variables vary over addresses, not values. Uh, and then the address, the uh, heap can be mutated to modify what the address points to. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, again, I know some people have seen things like the CEK machine. This is the CESK machine. This is, I'm adding a, I'm adding a heap. Uh, and let me show you what the, uh, what the transitions look like. Now, I want you to just ignore this for a second. So one thing that I'm going to do is uh, I want to be able to swap out different implementations of the heap. So I abstracted over the signature of, of heaps here, but we can just pretend like that didn't happen. OK, so here's the reduction relation. Um, so if you've got a number in a heap, you can throw the heap away. Operator in a heap, you can throw the heap away. If you've got a variable with an environment and a stack and a heap, well, then you can, uh, that takes a transition to the value that you get when you uh, look up the variable in the environment and get an address A back, and then look up uh, uh, the value V uh, that you get in the heap. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong place here. Uh, and then that's the value you get. The stack stays the same. The heap stays the same. But we're just doing this lookup. So, uh, so variables are slightly different in that we have to dereference things through the heap. Uh, and then our function application changes now because instead of extending the environment with uh, the variable being bound to a value, we need to generate a new address, bind the variable to that address, and then update the heap. OK, so I know this, uh, this rule is a little bit uh, hard to read, but there we're matching on the, the function application in the context of a stack and a heap. And what we do is we uh, we jump to the body of the function in an extended environment where uh, each of the bound variables uh, is going to be bound to some A, where I'm going to call an allocation function. Okay, So I'm going to give it the current uh, state of the machine, and I'm going to say uh, allocate some addresses for me, and give, give me back the appropriate number of addresses, and I'll put them in the environment here. And then I'm going to extend the heap, saying that you know, each of those addresses is mapped to the appropriate value. Okay. And then recursive functions, I mean, is, is sort of the same idea, except I also need to allocate an address for the function itself and, and so on. But that's it. The rest, the rest stays the same and just happens in the context of a heap. So it doesn't need to use the, use the heap, update the heap, anything else. These are the only rules that do anything relevant to the heap. OK, now uh, I abstracted this thing over because I want to use different uh, memory allocators. And I'm going to have different uh, implementations of heap extension and lookup. I just pulled these out as a parameter. Uh, uh, yeah, here. Good. So um, what I'm saying here is uh, that this matches any sequence of uh, x colon t's. And notice I'm also using underscore 1 here. So this matches any sequence of v's, but they have to be the same length. Okay, So I can give names to my ellipses. Uh, and if I use ellipses in multiple places with the same name, that imposes the constraint that they're the s of the same length. OK? OK. So uh, I can show you a couple uh, of um, 
allocation functions. The only thing that I really need is for my memory allocator to give me fresh addresses. Uh, bad things would happen otherwise. Uh, so that's really, that's sort of the spec for the alloc function. Uh, so here's one which is uh, we just take the name of the formal parameters and we use uh, uh, and we use as addresses a, uh, a list of two elements, okay, that is the name of the variable and then a unique symbol. So I'm using Rackets Ginsum function here to generate something unique. Uh, technically, all I really need is the Ginsum, but this will give me a sort of more readable way of saying, oh, this is the address for X or Y or whatever, okay? Uh, so then I can make a, a reduction relation by just saying which alloc allocator I want to use. You could imagine other ones. So this is the one that just uses GenSim. This is the one that uh, allocNAT, it counts, okay, so it generates the, the next number that's not currently in use as an address. Any of these will work just fine. Okay, and um, I... Uh, I would likewise like to make sense of this machine in terms of the things that I've seen before. The easiest thing to do is to relate it to the stack machine that doesn't have a heap, um, which of course I know is related to the reduction the closure reduction semantics, which is related to things before it. Um, so I did a similar thing making an invariant here uh, and uh, I tested it on a specific example, and then I turned it into a general claim, uh, which we can run. I, I had to, uh, oops. I had to make more of these meta functions that because now, for example, if I want to relate uh, a CESK state to a CEK state, I need to do things like eliminate the heap by uh, uh, inlining all of that stuff into the environment. So I just have these meta functions that translate from uh, CESK states to CEK states. And then I can check this invariant as we go. All right, so while that's crunching away, uh, I can add errors back in. Okay, just more of the same of what we've seen before. And then we'll get to the next. The next thing. Okay, so my, all of my I have 2,000 tests now, they all pass. Um, so the next, so now I have a handle on uh, how variable bindings are allocated in my machine. The next thing I'm gonna turn my attention to is the stack, okay? So the stack, I just have this inductive definition, it's a list, and I push and pop things uh, onto it, but I'm gonna have a more explicit I would like to have a more explicit kind of handle on the memory allocation that goes into making this list, uh, uh, and the stack <laughs> data structure. So what I'm gonna do, I mean the list in Racket, the list is just you know a linked list, and I can model that in my machine, right? I've got pointers, I'll just, uh, I'll just turn the stack into a linked list in the heap. Okay, and that's the idea of my next machine. So the next machine is going to be a, a variant of that CSK machine where uh, instead of a stack, I just have a, uh, a, a f either, so I just have a frame and a pointer to the next frame, okay, or the, or the stack is empty. Okay, so you can see here, this is just like the, uh, uh, 
that this is just either the stack is empty or I've got uh, a frame and it, rather than having a stack, I have a pointer. Now it's a pointer that in the heap I will find the next uh, frame and pointer uh, pair, okay? So my heaps are updated so that they now can store either values or uh, these little fragments of the stack, right? Either being empty or pointers, uh, a frame and a pointer to the next thing. Okay, so uh, I need to have a way of allocate. So now when I want to push, when I want to push, what I'm going to do is allocate a pointer, move the current uh, frame into the into the heap and install a new, a new frame. So I need to allocate every time I push. So I made a new allocator that, you know, based on what the frame that I'm trying to push is, will generate uh, uh, fresh addresses for those. And then I made this, uh, so here's my, here's my, um, machine transitions. Now, uh, so the only things that change are the things that were dealing with the stack before. So the things that pushed and popped the stack. So my eval and continue transitions change. So eval, which is pushing, uh, what it does now is it matches the same thing that it did before, uh, and it pushes a frame just like it did before, except that here, a is going to be something that we allocate, and we put what used to be uh, on the stack into the heap. Okay? So as we push, you know, the current thing gets knocked off and uh, put in the heap. And then when you continue, which is popping things off, we just need to, we're going to pop the top thing off and look at its pointer for what's next and retrieve it from the heap and install it, okay? Okay, so, uh, so that's what's happening in both of these rules. We, we pop the thing off, we take its pointer, we look it up uh, and install it. All right, now, I didn't formulate uh, an invariant here, but I'm expecting that these things should still, you know, these machines should operate in lockstep. Uh, I'm just, uh, right, I will just see memory being allocated in the heap for each, continue, or each uh, um, frame of the stack that I push, okay? And I can do the same thing where I uh, add in errors, that's no big deal. So let's look at this next thing. Okay, so up until now, what I've done is I've, I've made more explicit my accounting of uh, memory allocation uh, with respect to variable binding and um, stack allocation. And, um, and now that's good because I sort of have in the machine, I am modeling all of the, the growth here, right? If you look at... Uh, the machine state, right? It's not, it's not this inductive thing that's getting bigger and bigger. It, well, what you'll see is that the heap gets bigger and bigger, okay? So where things grow is in the heap. All right, now I'm gonna do something that just seems weird, okay? You could imagine doing everything I've done up until now as an implementation strategy because you wanna write your machine in C or something and you've got a, uh, you know, you're gonna, um, uh, implement the heap this way and, and so on. But this next thing is just weird, okay? So just bear with me for a minute. So I'm gonna take the heap and I'm going to uh, change its type so that it doesn't, uh, it's not a map from addresses to uh, values or stack frames. I'm going to make it map to a set of those. Okay, but it's gonna be a singleton set. 
Okay, that's what's weird. It's like, why are you making this a, sing a singleton set? Uh, we'll get to that. Um, but that's going to be the idea is I'm going to now put a set of things in there uh, and we'll have the invariant that it's always a singleton set. Uh, so it's a strange thing to do. Um, but, uh, uh, but let's see. Let's see. Oh, so all I did was I just um, I swapped in different uh, uh, different uses of extension and lookup. Is that right? Um, Yeah, so I just change out the implementation to, to work in terms of, the, uh, in terms of sets. Uh, I can add errors back in, that's no big deal. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> you might wonder like what would happen, so as long as your allocator returns, uh, so this is the key thing about the set-based machine, is as long as your uh, memory allocator returns fresh addresses, you always get the invariant that it's a singleton set. If your memory allocator was, say, broken, and it returned an address that was already in use, what would happen is it will, it will put both things in the set, right? So uh, when you go to extend it, it's going to say, oh, so the implementation of extension here is just join it in, right? Take the union of what's already there. Okay, so if your memory allocator is giving you fresh addresses, there's nothing there. So you're unioning it with uh, one thing, you get a singleton set. But now, uh, if you happen to uh, have gotten the same address, it will just add it in there. And then when you go to look something up, the way the semantics is defined is it just picks one non-deterministically. Okay. Which again is no problem if we're talking about a singleton set. Right? Um, pick any element you'd like, there's only the one. Okay, so those machines, the set-based machine uh, and the uh, non-set-based one, they should also, under the assumption that the memory allocator uh, gives you fresh addresses, they should operate in lockstep. Okay and I can add errors to it. Now I have a machine uh, that's in the form that I, that I want where I can just sort of flip a switch and turn it into an abstract interpreter. Okay, so the idea here is uh, I'm going to replace my memory allocator with one that's guaranteed to always give me fresh addresses with one that's guaranteed to always give me addresses from a finite set, okay? So that obviously is in conflict with the other thing that I needed the, the memory allocator to guarantee, right? If I say that there's a fixed size on the amount of memory you can allocate, it can't guarantee that I always get a fresh address, okay? But what happens uh, when I do that is the machine's guaranteed to terminate, right? It can't run forever if it has a fixed amount of memory. Uh, and um, it takes some convincing to figure out uh, why that is, but that's actually why I made sure that everything that, you know, any growth in the machine was actually happening in the heap so that if I set a limit on the size of the heap, everything will uh, eventually stop when I run things, right? The, um, I should sort of run out of uh, machine states that I can see. So I need to do one other thing, which is I need to take care of uh, I need to take care of the only other source of uh, a, a sort of unbounded growth in my machine, which is the base type that I have, 
of uh, natural numbers, or integers, I can't remember, but uh, either, one, either one grows without bound. So, uh, so I need to come up with some abstraction for my base types. Uh, I have one base type, it's uh, numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a new kind of number, an abstract number, called num. And the idea is you can think of this as this is an over-approximation of any number. Okay? And uh, I'm going to swap out my interpretation of the primitive operations so that they always produce num. Okay? So if you add 3 and 4, what does that add up to? It adds up to num. Uh, if you add 1 to 5, that's num. Okay. So this, my uh, delta hat here, is my abstracted version of delta. Notice how it's, um, it's a sound prediction of what the original delta was doing, right? If I said 3 plus 4 is 7, well, 7 is a number, so if I say num, that's, that's an over-approximation of what really happens, which is 7. Uh, and here, I'm going, to, I'm going to make my finite uh, memory allocator, well, uh, one potential finite memory allocator, which is I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to use that, um, Uh, I'm going to use my original memory allocator, remember, which was uh, the variable name and some unique address, and I'm going to chop off the unique address, and it will just be the variable name. So there's only a finite number of variable names that appear in any program that you write, so that's a finite set. Okay, so I've satisfied the property that my memory allocator always gives me uh, addresses drawn from a finite set. Now, there could be clashes, right? Because x could be bound to one thing at one point in the execution and another thing uh, at another point in the execution of the program. But in fact, what's going to happen is those two things will live in the same set in the, uh, in the heap. And then when I go to look up x, I will get back uh, non-deterministically one or the other. So my semantics will actually account for getting back either of them, which again is a sound over approximation. Right? Because when I'm actually running it, maybe x is one of those things, but that will be included in my, uh, that will be included in my semantics. So here's, here's the reduction relation. This is just saying I want to swap out in my delta rule, I want to, I want to, uh, use my delta hat meta function. And uh, there's only one other place where this new notion of an abstract number can appear, and that's in conditionals. So I need to say what it means to branch on an abstract number. Well, that's easy, though. So if num is the abstraction of all numbers, uh, it could be 0 or non-zero. So my rules just say that you take both branches. OK? Yeah? Could you just real quick go over how would this finitize the allocator? Uh, sure. So, um, uh, so it's, it's, a little, it's a little difficult to, to get from this, uh, from this code. But uh, um, what I'm doing is I'm taking the old allocator. So notice this is the define meta function extension. So I'm taking an, uh, an existing allocator that I have, uh, this alloc uh, circle thing, that always gives me unique addresses, but it always gives me, uh, it always gives me uh, pairs of things. So when it's allocating for a variable, it's the variable name and a unique piece of information. Uh, when it's allocating for stack frames, it gives me the uh, stack frame constructor and a unique piece of information. And so what I'm doing is saying I'm, I'm lifting that up to this new state space here. And then really what's happening, uh, the, 
uh, the work is being done in Alicat. So what Alicat does is it calls the underlying unique thing and then it takes as the address that it's going to return just the left part of that pair. So it's throwing away the unique thing. So we either get, you know, that you're pushing, so the addresses are all of the variables that appear in your program. That's a finite set, right? Unless you can write infinitely big programs, you have to write down a finite set of variable names. Uh, or it's uh, the, you know, uh, if zero or app for the name of the constructor for the frame. Okay. So that's how it's doing it. But now I want to emphasize that actually any finite allocator would be fine. If you just always produce the address zero, that would be totally fine. You would have a sound abstract interpreter. You can't make a wrong choice here. The only thing that you could do that would be a mistake is to have it not be bounded. And then your abstract interpreter could run forever. You could do round robin, pick random numbers, uh, whatever, okay? This particular allocation strategy of basing it on the variable names is just a traditional one in the program analysis community that corresponds to something like uh, the same approximation that zero CFA does, if you've, if you've looked at uh, something like that, okay? It's the same approximation that like the simple types are making, right? When you say lambda x colon uh, tau, you're saying every occurrence of x has to be used at type tau, right? And uh, here, what I'm saying is uh, every, every occurrence of x is going to, you know, anything that can uh, be bound to uh, any particular instance of x, right, it gets blurred together and they, they show up at any, any time that we reference x. All right. Uh, okay, so I, I can do the same thing about adding the errors back in. Um, and now, now what I want to do is just run some things. Oops, uh, I did this the wrong way. Let me run some things and let me take out, uh, yeah, I have a syntax error. Um, Maybe I'll just take out some random tests so that things run faster. All right, um, while, this is, while this is going, I just want us to think through uh, some of what will happen when we, um, when we run programs, okay? So, uh, you know, I can write programs that run forever, like uh, I did one, I think, yesterday or the lecture before that, where it was, I wrote a recursive function that added one to recursively calling itself. And uh, 
what's going to happen is, uh, right, I, um, when I do the operations, I get back num. And uh, eventually, it'll see that, oh, I'm calling this recursive function with num again. And it's able to, to bottom out, right? Whereas in the, uh, the concrete interpreter, it just keeps adding and going. And we never see the same state again. But now, because things get blurred together, I come back to the same state. Uh, eventually, and there's an argument to be made that uh, there's only a finite number of states that you can see starting from any given program, and therefore you can just run the abstract interpreter and it's guaranteed to terminate, and uh, it's going to be an over approximation of what happens uh, in the concrete interpreter. And this is important because, uh, you know, what I said, the, the sort of uh, this whole thing is about uh, being able to predict properties of uh, the uh, running the program for real. And so what's important is that this is something very strange is going on here. I don't know why it's taking so long. Uh, what's important is if, if you run things in the abstract uh, and something doesn't happen, what that means is it does not happen when you run it concretely. Okay. Now the, uh, the other direction is not true. Things that will happen in the abstract, they may or may not happen when you actually run the program. Right. That's just uh, that's a consequence of doing, doing the approximation, right? You just, uh, you don't know for sure. But if something doesn't happen, you have a strong guarantee uh, that it doesn't happen when you run it. So if you're interested in um, predicting like the, that there's no runtime <coughs> errors, you can do that with, uh, with this approach. So close that. Uh, see if this helps. Well, it's going to be unsatisfying if we can't see some examples of this, but uh... okay. Um, so, what I wanted to talk about uh, in the remaining time, when this comes up, we'll try to we'll try to look at some examples. <coughs> But what I wanted to talk about in the remaining time is how you can use this, okay? And this is, you know, I've done this for this, uh, uh, you know, toy programming language of PCF that nobody uses, but it illustrates the ideas. Uh, and, uh, but this scales up, okay? This idea scales up. So, um, if you take a step back, right, what, what's here is a recipe for going from uh, a reduction semantics for your language to an abstract interpreter for your language. Okay, so, uh, so just to give an example, right, we could take the reduction semantics from uh, Sam's talk on contracts and we could run it through this same process. Right? In fact, very little is going to change because all that really changes are uh, the uh, 
basic notions of reduction that deal with contracts. And we have a few new, you know, uh, a few new kinds of stack frames because the grammar of evaluation context changed. But then that's it, okay? So once you have uh, an abstract machine for PCF, it's actually fairly straightforward to make an abstract machine uh, for contract PCF. And now you might be interested in predicting properties like are there runtime contract failures, okay? And, uh, and now you can use this method to verify ahead of time that none of the contracts fail at runtime. Uh, and then you can do things like optimize away the contracts because you know they don't fail, so maybe you just omit them and can have an arbitrarily good impact on the runtime of your code. Uh, and in fact, Sam and I have worked on doing, on doing exactly that. Another thing that you can do is you can uh, cook up, um, what I want to know is where is it spending all this time I mean, I was running all of these examples right before, right before we started. Uh, that's really weird. It's bizarre. Um, uh, another thing that you can do is model, model new things in terms of reduction semantics. And uh, one thing that we've done there is we've looked at, let's make a reduction semantics that works over uh, <coughs> unknown inputs, okay? So the idea is I wanna be able to run, run my program, but over inputs that I don't know about. And the basic idea here is sort of morally the same as what goes on in uh, symbolic execution, where that's the idea. You want to run your program. Uh, you've got a program that takes in an X and a Y and computes something with, uh, in terms of X and Y. But instead of giving it concrete inputs, you just say, I'm going to treat X and Y symbolically. And so you make your reduction semantics deal with these symbolic values, and you'll get to points where uh, you want to do some operation or you want to branch, on, uh, you have a conditional uh, that refers to X, let's say. Uh, and so what you do, you get, you get to if X something something else. So you just make your reduction semantics take both branches, but it keeps on the side a condition about what must be true about X to be in that path of the program, the, that execution of the program. Uh, so, <clears throat> so this is the idea behind symbolic execution. It's typically a, um, it's typically a testing approach where you run your semantics, uh, which will not terminate, okay? So you just run it and run it, and at some point you stop, just like in the traces window when I was, uh, I could run things that you know run forever, but you <coughs> explore, explore it to finite depth. And then you can look and see if there's any errors in it, right? Does it get to any state where uh, it says you divide by zero? Then you can look at the path condition Right, which is a, a logical formula over the variables that got you to that point in the program. And you can ask if that path condition is, uh, if that logical formula is satisfiable or not. And if it is satisfiable, then you have a real error in your program. Moreover, you can generate from the path condition the particular inputs that get you to that error uh, or you could discover that the path condition is not satisfiable, which means that it's not actually a reachable error, and so you can ignore it. Uh, so this is a souped up testing uh, approach because you can uh, unfold things as, as long as you'd like and uh, potentially f you're, find you're searching for um, uh, 
bad inputs that crash your program. Uh, and it's testing, not verification, because uh, it may be that you just haven't gone far enough to see uh, uh, potential errors. Okay, but you can take that notion of reduction semantics and you can plug it into this framework and turn the crank and come up with uh, a machine that is guaranteed to terminate and over approximates the symbolic execution semantics and you can take that and turn it into a verification approach, right? Where you, uh, you generate these big graphs of the machine states that you can reach. Each of them has uh, path conditions on them and you can uh, try to verify each of those logical formula and if it's uh, uh, true that they're unsatisfiable, then, uh, then you verified the program, okay? And you can do this for things like contracts, okay? Um, right, and you can even, uh, the, one of the nice things about uh, the contract stuff is that for the things that don't verify, you can just always leave those in as runtime, uh, uh, runtime contracts that will be checked, okay? So you can, uh, you can always, you know, for, uh, for any program, you can, you don't have to reject programs outright like you might in most type systems. Uh, and you don't have to check everything like you do by default uh, with the contract semantics, but you can walk some, some middle ground where uh, the things that you, were ver that you verified, you can, uh, uh, you can eliminate the checking there. All right, so I think I'm going to just, this is sort of a disappointing note to end on, but I think I just have to give up here. Uh, I mean, somebody really needs to make progress on that halting problem thing so I could figure <laughs> out if this is going to stop or not. Uh, No, I took those. I took those out. Um, uh, let me see if I can fix this up. Uh, there's no red X check. This is commented out. That's fine. This is why you should not write tests, right? Uh, um, so this one's commented out. Those are commented out. Those are easy. That's commented out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's the same with typing, uh, speaking in complete sentences, <laughs> writing anything. Uh, yeah. All right, well, I'll say this. I'm glad Sam's not talking after me, so. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody.